I want to talk about our failures, our failures as moving beings. Arrested in my embarrassment, my shame, my guilt of letting the team down, my cousins would invite me to play football in their backyards every single Thanksgiving. I didn't know how to throw a football, let alone catch one. In fact, the very first time I even saw football, I simply thought you had to kick it. That's how ignorant I was of the sport. My cousins would attempt to help me by giving me some type of verbal instructions to somehow spark my performance. What they didn't realize was that it was during the midst of my distracted headspace while I was asking myself the questions, am I going to drop the ball? Am I going to even be able to catch it? What if I let the team down? Now, my cousins wanted to help, right? What was the disconnect between their verbal instructions and my ability to successfully follow them? For us to understand this principle, we have to investigate and diagnose how we were taught to move. My name is Patrick Pham, and I am a doctor of physical therapy at a rehabilitation institution so that those with a spinal cord injury, a traumatic brain injury, and also a gunshot wound injury will be able to do one thing, be able to reestablish their first steps again in walking. Not only have I worked with incredibly complicated neurological cases, but also with adults who look back in retrospect, wondering why they relinquished the sport that they loved. Here we are, 10 years later, twiddling our thumbs, wondering why are children able to move better than we are now? I'm here to tell you it's not too late. With help from motor or movement learning scientists, we can employ a few but significant principles to help maximize human performance. Today, I want to talk about verbal feedback. Verbal feedback is the performance-enhancing drug that is least mentioned and arguably the most important. For us to understand verbal feedback, we need to understand the types of verbal feedback, the timing of verbal feedback, and leveraging the autonomy of verbal feedback. Again, that is the type, timing, and autonomy of verbal feedback. There are three types of verbal feedback we can provide quantitative, qualitative, and retentive feedback. Quantitative feedback informs us of what we have done. It suggests that on Thanksgiving Day, I was able to throw the football to Christopher successfully three out of 10 times. That when Philip threw the ball to me, I was able to catch the ball six out of 10 times. And when my cousin Stacy attempted to trip me, I was able to dodge her foot nine out of those 10 times. Qualitative feedback, on the other hand, informs us of how we perform. When I throw the football to Christopher, am I bringing the arm back to my ear, extending at the elbow and snapping at the wrist? Lastly, we have retentive feedback. These are the long-term deposits we make inside of our long-term memory centers called the hippocampus of the brain to see whether or not we have stored that information for a long-term withdrawal many years down the line. The issue is this. We become either fixated on quantitative or qualitative feedback. If, for example, we become fixated on quantitative feedback, the individual, the athlete, the child will have a sense of, okay, this is what feels right, three out of 10 times. Unfortunately, if we never give any type of qualitative feedback, they're going to leave frustrated, arms crossed every single time, asking, why did I not improve? So what's the solution? The solution is this. We start, we initiate with quantitative feedback to give the individual, the athlete, the child, the ability to get a sense of what feels right, empower them with a sense of accomplishment. Oh, this is how my body is supposed to feel when it moves. Once they get that sense, we can now transition over to qualitative movement, to 
describe how they can modulate that performance. And as we give them the verbal cues, the verbal feedback to change how to bring the arm back to the ear to extend at the uh, elbow and snap at the wrist, that will hopefully increase our quantitative results or successful attempts. In between session to session, month to month, year to year, we have to afford open-ended questions to give an opportunity to make the deposits inside the long-term memory bank of the hippocampus so that they can withdraw it many years down the line by asking questions such as, do you remember what we worked on yesterday? Can you show me what we worked on last week? What did we instruct on uh, two months ago that we said that we want to remember? Again, by tapping into those long-term memory centers to withdraw those deposits that were made, we know that we have increased retention, and retention is the key. Now that we've discussed the types of feedback, let's go ahead and investigate the timing of feedback. Again, the three types of feedback are quantitative, qualitative, and also retentive feedback. There are different times we can provide feedback. For example, if I was left arrested in my frustration after Thanksgiving, coming home, I may ask mom and dad to go ahead and hire someone, a coach perhaps, to help me with my agility skills. As they help me with my agility skills, she may tell me, uh, I may increase uh, my agility by working on hurdles. And as I start to jump over these hurdles, I may start to trip over each hurdle. As I start to trip over those, hur those hurdles, that's when she provides said feedback. It's basically dictating that this is the green zone and anything outside of the green zone is an erroneous movement pattern, which for our sake, we'll call it the red zone. So anytime I start to trip over those hurdles into the red zone and I am no longer performing an optimal movement or motor learning pattern, then that's when we can go ahead and offer that feedback. We could even wait to summarize the feedback, waiting to the very end of the trial or the session to give said feedback. We could delay the feedback, waiting maybe five to 10 minutes after the trial to ask, how do you think you did? These are things we could see improvement on. We could even fade the feedback, starting in front-loading ourselves with lots of verbal feedback at the beginning of the session, but as time elapses, we start to taper off and draw the feedback away. Unfortunately, the type of feedback that my cousins provided for me was absolutely catastrophic feedback. This is the type of feedback we are all familiar with. It's when you go to a high school football game and we see the coaches yelling at their athletes, at their students, to try to modulate their performance in the midst of their distracted headspace. What we have found both anecdotally and scientifically is that there is a human impossibility to be able to dual task or do two things at once to modulate the performance in the midst of go time. So what have the motor learning scientists or movement learning scientists taught us? They have taught us that the longer we wait, the higher the retention to allow for more deposits to be made inside of the brain, inside the hippocampus, the long-term memory center. But even if we give quantitatively the perfect amount of feedback, and then we tell them how to qualitatively improve, and we even time the feedback perfectly so that they can maximize their amount of retention, what if they didn't want to change? This leads us to the autonomy of feedback. Autonomy is the lifeline that says, this is why I wake up and do what I do. And we need to start asking ourselves these questions early on in the activity. For example, 
In addition to my Thanksgiving performance, my brother wanted me to be able to play football with his high school friends while I was in elementary school. As an elementary school student, all I wanted to do was play tennis. I wanted nothing to do with football. So as we would review, run plays, uh, practice throwing around the football, what type of repetitions do we suspect I made deposits toward? I put in cheap repetitions, and if we have the amalgamation of multiple cheap repetitions, guess what type of results we yield? We get cheap results. Cheap repetitions lead to cheap results. The neuroscientists have told us time and time again that practice does not make perfect. Rather, practice makes permanent. I'll say it another one, uh, another way. Practice does not make perfect. Rather, perfect practice makes perfect. If we practice perfectly, that's how we, we are going to make those deposits of uh, perfect uh, repetitions so that they yield into expected results. This is the importance of leveraging autonomy. If we take our imposed demands and we project them onto an individual, an athlete, a child who does not want to improve on whatever the movement, motor learning performance uh, skill is, then they will be unmotivated to want to capitalize on that performance. Give them the opportunity to leverage the autonomy, to let them choose what they want to improve on or which sport and instrument they want to work on, and that will inform their abilities to maximize their performance. Today we talked about our failures, our failures as moving beings. We have told ourselves that we are not gifted enough, not talented enough, not able to play football like some of my other cousins were able to play. We were able to shatter those views in place for ones that set us up for success. The next time that we keep ourselves captive to the couch, Telling ourselves, look, I'm not getting off this couch because I'm not able to move like he or she is able to move. Let's be very careful. Take the time to identify and diagnose the story. Perhaps we were never taught to have the proper type, timing, and autonomy of feedback. Let's go ahead and Look to the re-engineering of human movement, verbal feedback to enhance our performance. This is the performance enhancing drug that no one talks about. And with that said, what type of feedback do you have for me?